Tonight, we're going to be talking about overcoming barriers to conducting functional analyses in clinical settings. Before we get started, just have some administrative items to make sure we're all on the same page and everyone is kind of oriented to, to what's going to go on tonight. So if you are new to WebEx, it's similar to many uh, conferencing platforms, we are using WebEx events, which means that all of the microphones of the attendees are muted. Um, so unfortunately, with um, you know many people in the, the audience, we're not gonna be able to have a vocal conversation back and forth, but you are welcome to send questions for me to the Q&A option. Those will just come to me. Um, and engage in the chat as much as you'd like. So some people have already started chatting in there. I have it open. So when you see me kind of looking off camera, I'm watching the chat, see, see what people are saying. Um, you have to select send to everyone if you want all the panelists as well as all of the attendees to see what you're saying. Um, I have noticed as I look at the list of people here, there are many functional analysis experts in the crowd. So um, you all please do speak up if there are you know, questions or comments that you would like to chime in on. If you are here for continuing education certificates because you are a board certified behavior analyst or board certified assistant behavior analyst, um, the requirement is that you attend live. So if you're watching this recording, we're happy that you are, are watching, but unfortunately we can't give certificates for watching the recording. But if you are one of the 89 people who are here right now, um, are able to attend live and earn CEUs, you have to be on, the lookout and listening for two codes, two code words that I will tell you during the next two hours. You'll then have to enter those into a form at the end. That is a requirement by the board just to make sure that everyone was here throughout. Um, so I will make them very obvious when they come. And then finally, um, we will share the slides. Dr. Michelle, you've been getting lots of emails from her coordinating everything. She also will send the slides and surveys and lots of good stuff to you after the event is over in the next couple of days, probably. Um, if you are just very eager for the reference list tonight, because you have to track down an article, there is a QR code right there that you could follow now. Um, if you can't follow a QR code at the moment, I also sent the link to you in the chat. So if you want to follow along with references, they are there. And the final administrative item is, especially if you are new to our series of workshops, um, it's not a one and done. This is not a standalone event. This is part of a series. So Dr. Michelle is going to uh, put some information about registering for our other upcoming workshops into the chat. Um, so there'll be a link to registration, how you sign up for them um, as well. Uh, yeah, and on that link, you will see everything that's coming up for the rest of this semester. So we hope to see you at some of those as well. So let's get started here. So a little welcome introduction. Um, who am I? We'll start there. Why am I talking? Um, I put a picture of myself just so you know what I look like when I'm not pretending to be flying an airplane with this headset on. Um, so that is me. I'm Dr. Sarah Mead Jaspers. I'm currently an assistant professor at Emirates College for Advanced Education in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. And that is where I'm presenting to you from today. Uh, kind of a little bit of my background, just so you know where I'm coming from in terms of the assessment and intervention of severe behavior, as well as functional analyses. Uh, my background is, is in psychology as well as education. So I know that we have behavior analysts as well as special education teachers in the virtual room here tonight. So I'm hoping uh, that I can kind of talk to all of you there. Um, kind of most relevant for tonight's talk, I did my doctoral work at the University of Florida under the supervision of Dr. Brian Awada. And I think that I have some uh, some old colleagues from there as well in the event. They can make themselves known in the chat if they'd like to. Um, but during that training, that's where I got a lot of experience in supervision, designing and, and conducting functional analyses. And I hope to be able to share some of that with you tonight. I think an important part of tonight that hopefully got some of you into the room is the clinical setting piece, right? So academic, that's all well and good, but how does that translate to clinical settings? 
Well, clinical is where I started my career in behavior analysis. I actually started with the New England Center for Children in 2006. Um, pretty soon after that, relocated at that time, it was called the New England Center for Children Abu Dhabi. The name has now been changed to Ahmed bin Rashid Center uh, for Special Education. I think I just messed that name up. Um, the MRC NEC um, operated by the New England Center for Children. Uh, there, I had a variety of roles, um, all directly working with individuals, many of them with severe behavior. From that point, that's when I relocated to the University of Florida. At that point, worked at a specialized school for um, individuals, especially individuals who were engaging in behavior that was so severe they could not be educated in a, a typical school or a typical classroom. And Dr. Michelle just put the link to MRC NEC into the chat for you if you're interested in learning about that program. After I finished at the University of Florida, I moved on to the University of Kansas, and there I was the director of North Star Academy. It was a, a lab school that was affiliated with Dr. Claudia Dozier and Dr. Pamela Neidert's labs there. Again, we were serving individuals um, who had severe behavior needs. Uh, we needed assessment and treatment before being transitioned back to less um, intense programs. And my most recent clinical experience with severe behavior was through Aurora University right outside Chicago in the United States and a program called Little City Foundation. This one was a residential program serving children and adults with severe behavior needs. And I served um, as their consulting BCBAD and faculty supervisor. Just a little bit to kind of, if you just signed up, you didn't know who you were gonna be talking to tonight. That's a little bit about me, but more important, I would like to learn about you. Um, there are now over 100 people here in the, the program. So we're gonna do this with some polls and Dr. Michelle is going to be the poll administer. So the first poll is, I am curious to know about your role in the delivery of ABA services. This will help me figure out and of how to, to cater my talk tonight. So if you could go ahead and click what your role is, there's a lot of options I know, I didn't wanna leave anyone out. <laughs> um, so please submit that and we will, we're not gonna give it five minutes, <laughs> we'll give it probably 30 more seconds and then we will wrap up so we can see who's here at the event with us tonight. And so it's calculating and then it will show us the range of who's here this evening. And in, if you are joining us or coming in a little late, welcome, happy that you're here. All right, so our poll results are up and we have about half of the crowd is a BCBA, awesome. And then the other half is not. So I hope that I can design this um, to kind of talk to all the groups in the audience. The next question I have for you is just about your, the current clinical or service delivery setting that you are in. So Dr. Michelle just put the next poll up. Uh, please, if you would mind, tell me what you're, where are you currently working? What's your, your setting? And as you're finishing putting your answers in there, um, given that 50% of you are BCBAs, um, this is very much geared to be a, a CEU event. If you're not a BCBA, I'll try to kind of start us off slowly, get you up to speed, um, and then we will kind of take off talking about some advanced topics. All right, so it is calculating our results here to see the clinical environment. Ooh, all right, so we have about a third. Now I can't see the answer. <laughs> I can't see what the responses were. Um, about a third of you are in specialized clinics or therapeutic schools, and about a third um, did not answer. So we got a we got a mix there. All right, let's do our last one, and this one is is pretty critical. What is your experience with functional analyses? I kind of put some different categories on there, so see which one um, fits fits your experience the best. Give folks 
my guess is that we have people from all these categories here. And then it will tabulate our results for us. Hopefully, whichever level you're at, you'll leave with some, hopefully some new information tonight. All right, so we have, oh, that's a pretty good, pretty good spread. So I hope that, you know, if you're a complete novice that I'll be able to introduce you to functional analyses. If you're at the advanced beginner or an intermediate kind of move you to the next level. Thank you so much for your participation in those to help me know who's here with me tonight. All right, so it's kind of our welcome opening. Here's our plan for the evening. Our agenda, we're going to go over some basic assumptions, terminology, make sure we're all on the same page. Diving a little deeper, we'll go into standard functional analysis methodology, make sure that everyone is, is understanding the criteria and, and um, components there. Then third bullet point, what you're all here for tonight, right? Barriers to conducting functional analyses, and I'm going to go through them one by one. So I'll do one barrier and recommendations for practice, and then another barrier and then recommendations for practice. And then I'll wrap up with just some, some final comments and we'll see if we can save a little bit of time for question at the end. So let's do this starting with basic assumptions and terminology. Um, the first basic assumption that we're going to make here is related to operant behavior. So, making the assumption that most behavior of interest in a treatment com uh, context is operant, meaning it's controlled by its consequences. We're not talking about reflexes or respondent behavior here. We're talking about operant behavior. And I know that there are many uh, Arabic speakers in the crowd, so I've also throughout the um, presentation, I've tossed a little bit of Arabic in from the English Arabic glossary of behavior analytic terms. Um, if you haven't seen that, there's the QR code for it. I'll also put a link in the chat to it. Um, one second. Uh, pretty nice to check out if you are working in a bilingual environment. So when we're talking about operant behavior, it's controlled by its consequences. We're talking about both adaptive behavior, um, you know, appropriate behavior, things like that, as well as maladaptive behavior or challenging behavior. Those two categories of behavior have common functions that we can talk about. If you're coming from the BCBA crowd, hopefully this is a, a big review for you. So our common functions would be potentially positive reinforcement. So we might engage in behavior to access um, social positive reinforcement, like access to attention or access to items or activities. We might get access to um, automatic positive reinforcement, sensory stimulation, just something that feels good to do it. And that again is adaptive behavior or maladaptive behavior. Or we might engage in behavior to access negative reinforcement or um, Social negative potentially could be escaping from aversive situations, getting out of doing work, escaping from social situations we don't want to be in, or some type of automatic negative reinforcement, some sort of pain attenuation or, or making aversive stimuli go away. So whether we're talking about adaptive or maladaptive, these are the, the reinforcers that we're talking about. The next term I want to go over is just problem behavior. Um, there's a lot of different terms, both used clinically as well as in the literature. So we have problem behavior, challenging behavior, aberrant behavior, maladaptive behavior. We all kind of use them interchangeably. I happen to use problem behavior for the only reason that I can abbreviate it PB and it fits on my slides very well. So that's what I'm going to be using tonight. And then I'm talking about a socially important behavior that's targeted for improvement. Usually this is a behavioral excess, meaning something that's happening too much that's interfering with skill acquisition, interaction with the community, or the health and safety of, of that person or others in the environment. Um, so it's aggression, it's self-injurious behavior, it's property destruction, stereotypy, all these behaviors that we typically want to decrease or eradicate. 
Another basic assumption has to do with ethics. If you were at our last uh, workshop, uh, Dr. Michelle walked us through um, some changes that are coming to the ethics code. This is from the 2014 version that is still in effect, the professional and ethical compliance code for behavior analysts. They actually mandate functional assessments there. Hopefully this is a, a review for you, but when behavior analysts are developing a behavior reduction plan, we must first conduct a functional assessment. This is a, a requirement. So um, as we're going through tonight, we'll kind of talk about what's, what's optional and what's not optional, but a, a functional assessment is not one of the optional things in our clinical work. So that kind of orients us to our, our basic assumptions, talking about behavior analysis, talking about terminology we're going to be using. Dr. Michelle has put some helpful links in the chat, so I recommend you know keeping the slides up, but also having the chat open. So we're going to move next into talking about functional analysis methodology, so we can then talk about barriers to conducting functional analyses. So when we're talking about functional behavior assessment, the words all sound very similar, right? So FBA, functional behavior assessment. Here we're talking about an umbrella label for any systematic attempt to identify the sources of reinforcement for problem behavior. It is required by many funding sources. In some cases, it's required by law. It's required by our ethics code to conduct a functional assessment. So this is a, a standard practice in our field. However, functional behavior assessment is not a specific type of assessment or a set of procedures. It includes anecdotal or, or indirect methods. It includes descriptive or naturalistic methods, and it includes functional analysis or an experimental analysis. So all of those, I have a cute little umbrella there, all of those fall under the umbrella of functional behavior assessment. And the methods certainly differ in terms of the complexity and validity. We'll kind of go through those in a moment together. So what are the goals of doing this? It's not just because our code tells us to, but why? So our goals of FBA, we're looking to identify the maintaining variable or source of reinforcement for a behavior. So that's kind of the proximal, the, the you know, really immediate goal. Long term, why are we doing this? We want to use that information about the variable to design an effective function based treatment. We want to be able to change behavior without these very restrictive procedures like hospitalizations, medications, harsh punishments, kind of 1970s era behavior modification where you're just kind of layering on reinforcement without really figuring out the why behind the challenging behavior that's occurring. So if we kind of think that with those goals in mind as we head into the rest of the content tonight, I think that you'll see that they all work towards these goals here. So let's head back to kind of what's under the umbrella and unpack those a little bit more. So we're going to go through the, the kind of three main major approaches to functional behavior assessment, the indirect assessment, the descriptive assessment, and the functional analysis. And we'll take those one by one. So starting with indirect assessment. Here, the basic characteristics, it, it's based on some sort of informant recall. So as the behavior analyst, as the person uh, conducting the assessment, we are not directly observing the behavior, right? We're getting verbal report from others. And it could take the form of structured interviews, checklists, rating scales. Um, there are many indirect assessments out there. Um, one example to kind of bring to the front today is the functional analysis screening tool. This is a, a indirect functional behavior assessment that helps to kind of dial in on different categories of reinforcement. So I know that you probably can't see the wording of all of the questions there, but this is what it looks like. I know that many of you are probably very familiar with it. Some of you have conducted studies with it, I know. Um, if this is new to you and you have not seen the FAST, don't worry, this is not a secret document that we keep from you. It actually is freely available in the Awada et al. 2013 article, so you can get a copy and, and use it as you wish there. 
the important piece when we're talking about um, determining function really comes from the scoring summary down in the bottom right corner of the FAST. And here you can see how each of the questions above are scored, and then you're looking at a potential source of reinforcement. So potentially uh, social reinforcement in the form of access to attention, preferred items, and so forth. Again, I know that, that many of you probably use this in your practice. If you do, feel free to tell us in the chat if this is something that you've used before, if you found it useful. Um, this is not a, a webinar where you need to keep silent the whole time. You're welcome to, to chit chat along the way. So our advantages here, they're indirect assessments. They're very simple. A lot of yes, no questions. Um, they're very efficient. You can do them quickly. Limited training, you know, I could hand the fast to someone who's not a behavior analyst and they could probably answer the question. I put no risk, maybe there's a little risk, but uh, you know, you're not evoking any, any problem behavior. There's not really a risk in administering the assessment. So there's some good stuff there. Some limitations though, they can be really subjective. Um, you're getting someone's opinion about the behavior. They generally have very poor reliability and validity. So meaning if you have two people fill them out, a lot of times they don't match. Um, and then when you compare them to a full functional analysis, oftentimes they don't match there. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the indirect assessments sit somewhere around 60 to 80% in those measures. And they're, they're generally insufficient for treatment design. We don't want to use something that has such poor reliability and validity when we have someone's future um, in our hands. We want to be a lot more certain than that. So some suggestions for use for indirect assessments. Definitely, I use them to gather preliminary information about problem behavior. Um, it helps me write the operational definitions. I'll also, I'll try administering them to multiple informants or, or people who are filling them out to see if I get some patterns or some matches. And then the final bullet point is the most important to me. I use that information to design follow-up analyses. That was a quick uh, walk through indirect assessments. We'll move on to descriptive assessments now. So here are the, the basic characteristics. Now, as the person conducting the assessment, we have our eyes on the behavior. Um, we are actually observing the problem behavior. We're observing the environment. We're not manipulating any variables. We're just sitting back and watching, right? And we might collect some quantitative data how often is this behavior happening, or qualitative, where we kind of describe the situation. We have some different options. We have scatter plots where we're recording kind of what time of day um, behaviors are occurring, antecedent behavior consequence, or better known as ABC recording, where we're recording kind of a temporal uh, stimulus changes. So what occurred first, what was the behavior, what occurred after. And there are um, contingency analyses where we kind of start um, analyzing those variables. Now, I know that ABC data is very popular in, in clinical work, not just anecdotally, but there are, we'll talk about some publications um, that confirm this. Just a word of caution, if ABC data collection is your preferred functional behavior assessment, just some things to be cautious of. For ABC data to be useful, conditional probabilities really must be calculated and then compared to background probabilities. Now, it's very that's very math oriented, very much outside the scope of tonight's workshop. But just a, a note of caution, Dr. Tim Vollmer and his colleagues in 2001 published a paper where they um, really walk you through what a, a proper ABC assessment should look like. It's a very dense article, but if you are someone who uses ABC data, I highly encourage you to read this article. It talks about how ABC data really requires <clears throat> that you know the probability of the antecedent given the target behavior, the probability of the antecedent given no target behavior, the consequence given no target behavior, and the consequence given target behavior. So it's a, sometimes I'm not sure that people when they conduct ABC data really have, have con, um, calculated all of those probabilities. 
So kind of some advantages and disadvantages here. We definitely have the advantage of being more objective. So we are actually watching the behavior. It's more reliable. If we have two people watching, um, they will reliably observe and record the same behaviors. But there are some limitations. It is very time consuming. You kind of have to sit around and wait for the behavior to occur. And then you have to do some hefty calculations. Even then, it only identifies correlation that these two things are happening around the same time, not that one is causing the other. They also happen to be very biased towards social positive reinforcement in the, the form of attention. Um, you can imagine why this happens if someone's engaging in very disruptive behavior. Uh, what do you have to do? You have to intervene, right? And you're giving attention. So if I'm there collecting ABC data, I'd be like, attention, attention, attention. And that may be an irrelevant variable that's totally masking the, the relevant one. So there are a lot of, a lot of problems um, with using descriptive assessments to identify function. So what do we recommend that they're used for? Um, if there's a reason to believe that idiosyncratic or very unique, very individualized variables are in play, um, for sure, I'll go do a descriptive assessment to kind of get in there and see what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. But then, same bullet point as before, use that information to design follow-up analyses. So as we wrap up talking about descriptive assessments, we'll, we'll end with some kind, final comments actually from um, the article that initiated the whole whole path of descriptive assessment. So Dr. Bijou and colleagues in 1968, uh, they were the first ones to really talk about what a descriptive assessment is, how to do it, how do we look at data. And even in that article back in the 60s, they said descriptive studies provide information only on events and their occurrence. They do not provide information on the functional properties of events or the functional relations among the events. In yellow, experimental studies provide that kind of information. So there are a lot of advantages and times to use it, but as far as, as really nailing down and identifying the function of a problem behavior, a descriptive assessment um, has some disadvantages in that way. Um, and if you are excited about research as I am and going back to the articles, Dr. Michelle is being super helpful in putting those citations in there. So you'll get the whole list of references, but if you wanna check any of them now, you can follow the links that she's dropping in the chat. All right, so now we are into functional analysis, the third approach under functional behavior assessment. Here's really our, our hallmark of behavioral assessment at this point in the development of behavioral assessment. It's an experimental model to identify that cause effect relation between the environment and problem behavior. This is what Bijou and colleagues were talking about. Here's the experimental analysis. And it involves systematic exposure to controlled assessment conditions. You now, many of you um, have conducted FAs, et cetera. Many of you have probably explained them to parents. We'll often explain it as the allergy test of behavioral assessment. We're exposing clients to small controlled dosages of potential reinforcers to see when problem behavior flares up, to see under what conditions problem behavior will occur. So until the 1980s, uh, the indirect descriptive assessments really were primary assessments used in practice. But then with the publication, very famous article, right, toward a functional analysis of self-injury in 1982, uh, that is when Dr. Awada and colleagues changed the approach to the assessment and treatment of severe behavior disorders. So again, a, probably a review for many of you, but our general standard FA procedure here is derived directly from that Awada article from the 1980s that was republished in 1994. And we're comparing levels of problem behavior observed during testing control conditions. So in our test conditions, we present a potentially aversive situation and we deliver a consequence contingent on problem behavior. We want to see if problem behavior is going to occur then. And in our control condition, we're presenting all potential reinforcers continuously. 
and we repeat exposure to all of those conditions and we continue until we see differentiated responding. We're seeing more problem behavior in one condition than another. When we look at typical FA conditions, they usually look like this. These are what were in the original article. We usually have a, an attention condition, which is a test for social positive reinforcement. Here, the client is not getting any attention at all. If they engage in problem behavior, we come over and deliver attention. We want to see if they're doing this to access attention. We have a demand condition, which is a test for social negative reinforcement. So here we're presenting work, we're presenting instructions. If they engage in problem behavior, we say, okay, you don't have to take a little break. We're looking there to see if problem behavior is occurring to access escape. And then we usually have an alone condition or a no interaction condition where we just want to test for automatic reinforcement. Is this behavior going to occur even when no social consequences are delivered at all? And we'll, we'll go through these one by one and then we do a control condition. We call this the play condition. There's no program demands, non-contingent attention. It's just the life is good condition. And we'll repeat exposure to each of those until we see that more problem behavior is occurring in one than the other. It's a comment here at the bottom that's going to be very important for today with overcoming variables, uh, overcoming barriers. We can test any variable we want to. We don't just have to test access to attention, access to escape, or, or automatic reinforcement. As long as we design a test condition in which the variable, the potential reinforcer, is delivered contingent on problem behavior, and a control condition in which the variable is delivered non-contingently, we're doing an FA. That's all we need. We just have to have a test and control so we can compare the responding under those conditions. So let's look at some sample data. Tonight, whenever you see a graph that does not have a citation on the, on the graph, um, that is because those are my data um, that I have collected throughout my years of conducting functional analyses. All of them have fake names, of course, to protect the privacy of the clients. So the fake name here is Josh. So Josh was referred for the assessment and treatment of aggression. So we're looking at the responses per minute of aggression across the sessions. And each condition is denoted by a different symbol. So the first condition we ran was a no interaction condition. We just hung out in the room with Josh, but we didn't interact at all. No consequences. We didn't see any aggression. Our next session, we ran an attention condition session. We still didn't see any responding, so we moved on. These are all um, five minute sessions here. So we do five minutes of no interaction, five minutes of attention, five minutes of play, no problem behavior. That's good, it's our control condition. Then we did five minutes of the demand condition. Still didn't see any, but that's okay. We've only had one exposure to each. So we continue on and now we can start to see different levels of aggression occurring in each of these. And at this point, by the time we got to 20, we said we are done. We have identified that Josh's aggression is maintained by access to attention. When he's getting that as a reinforcer, he's engaging in much, much more attention, uh, much, much more aggression. So what does that tell us? <laughs> His aggression was maintained by access to attention, but now we know how to intervene effectively. So we could give Josh lots of attention all the time, non-contingent reinforcement. We could minimize the amount of attention after aggression. We could put aggression on extinction. We could teach Josh a safer and more socially acceptable way to ask for attention, differential reinforcement of an alternative behavior. Now, intervention is a totally different webinar, right? But I just want to try to link the assessment to um, where we're ending up at the end. So this next slide is a slide where I really would like to see some participation in the chat because I want to hear your ideas, especially from clinical practice. Um, what might happen if we did not identify or did not correctly identify the function of Josh's aggression? What would the outcome be for his interventions if we didn't run the, the FA, we didn't identify it? So right where Dr. Michelle has written, please share your ideas from clinical practice. You can type in the chat, send it to everyone so we all can see. Um, 
what do you think? What might happen? I'm going to pause for a second, take a drink of water and let you. Let you enter some of your ideas. I'm looking through the attendance list now and I can also see some of my old students in the, the room. So feel free to to chat in there. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, so I have a few more seconds to see if anyone enters into the chat. If not, we'll move on so we don't waste too much time here. So some potential outcomes we might see. Um, we might end up with an ineffective intervention. Yeah, we might not see a reduction. Thank you so much, Tara, Tara or Tara, either one. Thank you for being, being willing to get, put yourself out there. Um, we might waste time as we use kind of a trial and error based approach to intervention or worse above all, we might end up with a contraindicated intervention, meaning that we have almost the complete opposite of what we should be doing. So if someone's problem behavior is identified to be maintained by escape, the worst thing we could do is have them, you know, it's used loosely, but have a timeout or have them take some time away because we will be reinforcing the problem behavior. So this is really the, the caution there of why we need to identify the function. So, I've just talked you through functional analyses, but I am certainly not as eloquent as Dr. Iwata on this topic. So if you would like to hear him talk about functional analyses, or if I've kind of left you with any questions, this is, I think the video is like an hour, two hours, um, from Western Michigan University's Autism Center of Excellence Autism Training videos. The citation is in your reference list, so I recommend if you want to hear him talk on that, um, bookmark that and come back to it later. So I kind of talked you through the, you know, the advantages and why we want to identify function. Uh, so hopefully you're all sitting there like, yay, FA, we all want to do FAs, wonderful. However, um, there's potentially a nay FA um, uh, <laughs> situation out there. So in 2015, Dr. Eileen Roscoe and some of her graduate students and colleagues conducted a survey assessing practitioners' use and perceived utility of functional assessment. And they found some very interesting results. I've highlighted them for you down there. So a majority, over 67% of practitioners, believed that functional analysis was the most informative assessment tool for selecting a behavioral treatment. We don't have to convince them of it. They're yay, FA. However, less than 35% of the respondents indicated that they typically used a functional analysis to inform the development of their behavior plan. So if you want to see the, the graph here, it is the, the top panel looking at the percentage of respondents separated by levels of training, ask them what's the most informative assessment. So everyone, the hash bars, the striped bars, everyone, majority in each category is saying functional analysis. We move down to the bottom panel and we ask them what they use. <laughs> And we see it completely reverse. Um, there are very, this is probably one of the most concerning. So master's level would be a BCBA, right? Very few um, are using um, functional analyses the most. So Roscoe and the colleagues um, kind of started pondering what could account for the discrepancy. And they came upon some either perceived or actual barriers, like the length of time required to conduct a functional analysis, the complexity of them, acceptability of conducting them, how amenable they are to certain types of behavior, the environmental or space requirements, training requirements. Uh, so they kind of went through all of these but then their commentary was very 
very pointed. So they said many of these perceived barriers that had some merit in the past no longer do so because empirically der derived solutions have been reported for each of them. They did make a kind of a, a sidebar note that it does seem possible there may be occasional exceptions to this rule. For example, extremely violent or, or dangerous behavior that cannot be allowed to occur even once. So we've talked about functional behavior assessment. We've talked about functional analyses. And then we've learned that a lot of people aren't conducting them, which takes us really to the bulk of tonight's topic, which will be going through um, lots of barriers to conducting functional analyses and hopefully for each of them giving you some recommendations for practice so that you could actually, if you feel like you're encountering one of these barriers in your clinical practice, you'll leave tonight with some recommendations about what you could do. Now, let's see if we can get some participation in a different way. So I have, I would love to hear what barriers you have encountered. Um, maybe this will be a little less intimidating because it is going to be anonymous. So we're gonna use a platform called WooClap. It is a, a website and it looks like this. Let me stop sharing these slides and bring this over. So it looks like this. So you'll follow that link that I just put in there. If they ask for the code, it's those capital letters at the end. And I want you to tell us what barriers you have encountered when attempting to conduct functional analyses or even trying to get functional analyses going in your clinical setting. All the responses will show on the screen, but they're all anonymous. So your name, I, I can't even go back afterwards to see who wrote what. Uh, feel free to write more than one. Ooh, we're getting lots already. All right, this is awesome. So let's look at these. The fun part about this is they move around, so I have to be fast. Lack of experience, lack of resources, not skilled enough. Oh, these are awesome. Scared staff, short on time, scared to evoke problem behavior, high magnitude behaviors, lack of uh, parent buy-in. I'm sorry if I'm not reading your specific one. There's are so many time training. Um, parents decline the FA procedures. Inability to gain stimulus control in the environment. <laughs> Behavior decreases between running some assessments and planning the FA. These are awesome. Um, I'm excited afterwards to go back and look at any of these too to see if there are more that I can add the next time I do this workshop. Lack of confidence, I hope I can help you with tonight. Um, acceptability, you hear that a lot. Um, lack of supervision, frequency of behavior, untrained staff. Very cool. I'll leave that up for another second while I take a quick sip of water and then we'll see if we can address some of these. All right, very cool. 50, 57 people were chatting on there. That's awesome. All right, let me slide this off the screen. That is really helpful for me to see. That I think some of the barriers that we're going to talk about are exactly the ones you are encountering. So this is what I have planned for you. We're going to go through seven. Assessment complexity, training requirements, I saw that on WooClap a lot. Time constraints, saw that. Setting constraints, like the space to do it. High risk behavior, saw that. Low rate behavior, someone mentioned that. Uh, undifferentiated results, I don't know if I saw that one, but that's like you start running it and you're not seeing higher levels in a certain condition. And then the final one, acceptability. So I hope that I hit on a lot of um, the barriers that you're seeing in your clinical practice. Now, before I jump into these, I want you to know that you please do not take my word for all of this. There are two fantastic articles that were published in Behavior Analysis and Practice, the journal. Um, the first one by Dr. Greg Hanley, uh, Functional Assessment of Problem Behavior. This goes through many of the barriers and ways to overcome them, as well as another article and behavior analysis in practice. This was in the first um, volume, first issue of behavior analysis in practice. This was written by Dr. Brian Awada and Dr. Claudia Dozier. So these are all uh, very, very well-trained, very um, 
experienced people sharing their um, kind of tips and tricks to overcome these variables. So I don't want you to think that I've come up with all of these. What I'm doing for you tonight is kind of breaking it down as well as giving example clinical examples from my own practice. So you'll see a mix of what's in the literature and then some some data and examples from what I've seen. So let's get into it. We will go through these one by one. So we will start with assessment complexity and training requirements. So we have to kind of ask some questions here first. Uh, and the first one is who should be able to conduct an FA session? So what skills are required? If you can think of any, feel free to put them in the chat. But if you think about what you have to do as someone in a a session of a functional analysis. What do you have to do? You have to, there's usually a protocol, so you have to follow the protocol. You have to observe behavior. You have to make a determination about whether you're deliver or withhold reinforcement. So what does that kind of sound like, right? Reading a plan, following directions, applying differential consequences. Sounds like the skills that are needed um, to be a behavior analyst, uh, even you know, re registered behavior technicians, that's a huge part, right? Being able to follow a treatment plan, deliver reinforcement when you're supposed to. So the skills to actually conduct a session are very similar to the skills that you need to be able to run any sort of other trading session. And certainly if you are competent enough to be writing treatment plans where you're delivering differential consequences. I want to boost your confidence. You have the skills that are, are necessary here. And this is shown in the research. So uh, there are many types of groups that have been shown to be able to conduct a functional analysis. And these are all really early citations on purpose. <laughs> so I want to show you how long this has been established. This is not tenuous or kind of experimental. Um, undergraduate students can do it. Bachelor's level therapists can do it. Teachers can do it. Parents can do it. Um, many, many groups of people have been successfully taught how to run a functional analysis. Now, certainly there are different levels of training required for different types of skills, right? So the most basic would be just to conduct FA sessions. I that's I feel very confident that registered behavior technicians can, uh, students can, as long as someone has training in delivering and withholding reinforcement and kind of basic behavior analysis, they can conduct an FA session. Now, next level, you know, designing and interpreting the data from a basic FA, that's a, a skill that hopefully people are learning at the master's level, the BCBA level. And then you move up to kind of the next level of training, which would be to design and interpret a very complex or difficult functional analysis of an FA of, of dangerous behavior and things like that. So you can kind of think about when we started, you kind of categorized yourself of where you thought you were. And then I would encourage you to kind of think about where you would like to be next in your training. So if you or someone you supervise wants to move from one level up to the next, seek out evidence-based training. That's the way to do it is to get hands-on practice and, and supervision and try it. Um, so my recommendations here, uh, behavioral skills training, a great place to start. The Lerman article there is, is not about conducting functional analyses, but rather using behavioral skills training to teach um, the skills necessary to be a behavior technician. So kind of similar there. So let's look at a, an example. So this was from the Awada lab. So we needed to train our undergraduate students to conduct functional analysis sessions. So if you were a student in that class, you've probably seen these procedural descriptions before. So we would start by handing out instructions, the first step of um, behavioral skills training. Then we'd model, sometimes we do it with a video model, sometimes we do it in class. Then these two steps we would do until the undergraduate students met mastery. So usually we'd start in class where they're role-playing, they're you know, pretending to be the therapist in the conditions, 
they give feedback to each other, we give feedback to them. Moving up to, you know, here's a, a situation where there's a doctoral student here doing behavioral skills training with an undergraduate student to conduct sessions correctly. So this is a good way, you know, if you want to get started, behavioral skills training is an evidence-based way to learn how to conduct functional analyses. Now also, uh, Dr. Iwata and Dr. Dozier made it easy for you. You don't even need to write your own instructions. So in their 2008 article, Appendix A actually has some instructions for some functional analysis conditions written out. So we have behavioral skills training. There's also a, a cool example of computer based training. Um, so if we can't do it live face to face, such as as now, um, maybe we can do some computer based and then hot off the presses. Dr. Casey Clay and his colleagues. It is in the early view online on the journal of behavior analysis right now is virtual reality based training. Um, so again, this it's not totally specific to functional analysis skills, but there are um, uh, re virtual reality based approaches to training that have been demonstrated to be effective. So lots of ways to access training if you need it. The most important to find a supervisor who's done this before and to make sure that you're using an evidence based approach. Um, definitely not recommend, you know, just watching a video about it. That would not be ethical because you would not have demonstrated competency prior to starting. So that's our first barrier. Up next is time constraints. So with time constraints, I want to start really with a guiding question here. <laughs> um, and that is. I always try to ask, you know, how do I assess the function of behavior as efficiently as possible without compromising the quality or the accuracy of the assessment? So I want to find that balance. Obviously, we don't want to keep our clients in assessment for too long. We want to move on to intervention. But if we want rush the process, that's when we start making mistakes and behaving unethically. So there are some other questions that I also consider when people say, I don't have enough time to conduct functional analyses. I usually start conversation with them about some of these questions. So, you know, whose constraints are these? Who's telling you that you don't have enough time? Is this a, a funding source? Is this a supervisor? Is this a parent a school district? And what contingencies are at play? with respect to those constraints. So if it is an insurance company that's saying you only have three hours for that are three billable hours for assessment, you know, who's kind of the money is at play there. I also ask it, what happens if I take more time? So what are the consequences there if I go over these time constraints? And I also want to have frank conversations with people about who benefits if more or less time is spent on assessment and who suffers if more or less time is spent on assessment. So I don't know if people have any, maybe I got you warmed up with the woo clap activity, but have people encountered any of these constraints before or have thoughts related to any of these questions that you've seen in clinical practice, feel free to tell us in the chat. Uh, you know, if you put time constraints as one of your barriers, where are those restraints coming from? I'm also curious, since we have people from all over the world, um, if the constraints are coming from different places in, in different countries. Oh, there are lots of comments in the chat, but I can't see. <laughs> No, <laughs> Dr. Cloda, I cannot see lots of things. Yeah, Dr. Sarah, sorry for interrupting. I was just going to say we're, we're experiencing a technical glitch, but Dr. Cloda, I'm going to unmute her so that she can share the comments with her. I'm working on the, techni the technical issue, okay? So thank you and sorry, Dr. Sarah. Oh, well, that's, I'm excited. I just thought I was talking to myself. I'm glad that people are participating. Dr. Cloda, please um, do let us in on what's being said in the chat. Hi everyone. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Thank Sarah, there's actually been like a lot of engagement. 
that I didn't realise you couldn't see it. <laughs> Sorry, I should have. But I only just got the great idea to to message you directly just now. Um, but let's have it. Uh, let me just get straight to the question at hand. So, um, one comment from Rachel Mason is saying, you know, a, a non-functional analysis, a non-functional analysis FBA is so inefficient. It takes so long to take review and analyze ABC data. But she should listen to herself. So I believe she's probably still doing some of that. Um, Direct paying clients are unable to pay the cost of assessments. Insurance companies decide how long we get to complete an assessment without working knowledge of how long it actually takes to do it effectively. Um, and I think that's using uh, time outside of assessment is discouraged by the employer in the clinic and being spread too thinly among many students. More reinforcement for meeting skill acquisition goals rather than behavior reduction goals. Very interesting. And again, more about insurance. Um, so what I can do is uh, I can maybe type, I can paste them into the all panelists or do you want people yeah. to say to you? I like the fact that all the panelists can see or all the um, attendees. I See the I think I, I would rather that everyone who's attending gets to see, and then maybe you can just uh, feed me any that uh, either our questions or comments that I should detour to. Does that sound okay? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send a cross section. Okay. Thanks. Okay, cool. Thank you. Well, I'm so happy to know that you're out there and, and participating, everyone. Um, yeah, those are all barriers and, and strong barriers. So, kind of the point of this slide is that. We have our technical clinical work to do, but we may also have some advocacy work to do. I think there's a mic that I need to mute. I don't know if that's not, okay. Uh, so there's potentially some advocacy work that we need to do because you know our ethics are on the line, right? So if our assessment process is rushed or the function is not correctly identified, then we really are potentially in violation of, of section 3.01a. So, again, it's not really the topic of tonight's webinar, but time constraints are one that bother me because it doesn't have a lot to do with the clinical situation. These are contingencies placed on us by other bodies. But if you have time constraints, we're going to talk about how to deal with it. So the first recommendation with time constraints is to really maximize the assessment sequence. Um, so someone was mentioning this, I can't see the name, um, but how long it takes to do some of these. So a good way to maximize the assessment sequence is to conduct a very quick, very fast function-based indirect assessment with two informants. So the, the MAS is an indirect assessment, the QABF is one, the FAST is one. Um, so conduct one of those, do it quickly, give it to a parent and a teacher, and then See if they suggest the same function. If they're both saying like, this is definitely maintained by attention. Cool, let's conduct a quick single function test. Let's not run every single condition of the functional analysis. Let's just do alternating a test for social positive reinforcement. So run an attention condition, run a control condition. So this is an image from the Iwata and Dozier article, but it's not real FA data. It's just kind of fake data to show you what a single function test would look like, but this is a functional analysis. You don't have to run all four standard conditions. If you have reason to suspect that there's a certain reinforcer, go for it. Just test that variable and a control condition. And then this was kind of bought, brought up in the chat. Definitely recommend omitting descriptive assessments unless they are indicated. It takes so much time um, to conduct those, analyze the data, et cetera. So maximizing the assessment sequence here, there's also a very specific version where you could consider using a screening phase. So here you would do the same thing. You'd conduct a function-based um, indirect assessment with two informants. If the indirect assessments suggest an automatic function, you then utilize a screening phase where you're running all alone or, or no interaction sessions. This is what Dr. Angie Quirum did. I think she might be out there in the audience somewhere. Um, but she tested this in her 2013 paper where she was looking at whether problem behavior 
a lot of them were stereotypy, would persist in a screening assessment first. So for Jake, she confirmed, she just ran three sessions and confirmed that the behavior continued in the absence of any social reinforcement. For the purposes of research, she then ran a full functional analysis to confirm that it was maintained by automatic reinforcement. Um, but that's a, a good option if you have indirect assessments suggesting an automatic function. All right, another option if you are short on time um, is to consider a brief functional assessment. And I see some questions coming up, but it's actually really confusing when they're all coming from the same person because I can't tell <laughs> which is which. So maybe we'll just save time for some questions at the end or feel free to chat amongst yourselves uh, and I will come back to them later. Okay, so consider using a brief functional assessment. It was, was first introduced um, by Northup et al. in 92 and Derby et al. In the, the second article there, they were actually able to identify a function in 50% of their cases running a brief functional assessment. So a BFA is just one exposure to every condition. So here, whatever square it was, um, saw higher levels there, they did one repetition of it and then did a, pre a treatment probe. So this is like the most bare bones that you can, um, can do and, and still consider it a functional analysis. Uh, do understand that there's no replication, which makes the results a little tenuous. Um, so if you have to use it, go for it. Um, it is an evidence-based approach, but it's a very um, it's a quick snapshot. Potentially a little bit better might be what Vollmer and colleagues proposed in 1995, and that was to progress from a brief FA to a more extended FA um, if it's not clear right after the brief one. So over here on the left, this is the model. So you only have a short amount of time. Let's do a brief FA. If it, the data are super differentiated, go for it, go to treatment. If that brief FA, if you're not confident on it, then go down and run a more standard multi-element functional analysis. If it is differentiated, cool, go to treatment. If not, you can go on to an extended no interaction. This is what um, Dr. Angie Quarum and colleagues did with the screening phase. You can use some more design changes, but just here's a, a model for you if you wanna try being brief at the beginning and then potentially um, where to go if you're not seeing results. The absolute uh, simplest solution is just to shorten the sessions. <laughs> so the original Awada et al. paper, they used 15 minute sessions, but much, much shorter sessions have been demonstrated to be just as effective. So Dr. Michelle Wallace and Dr. Brian Awada in 99, um, they showed that, that generally 10, five, 10 minute sessions, those are just fine. Standard clinical practice for me, I run five minute sessions unless I have a reason to run longer sessions. Another option um, is to potentially consider a latency-based FA. Uh, we will return to this a little bit later. So I'll just kind of plant that seed now and we will come back to it. Uh, but here, <laughs> fun participation and uh, Dr. Kaluta can tell me your answers. Uh, how long do you think this functional analysis took me to run? I was assessing aggression for a uh, fake name, Spiro, and we identified that his aggression was maintained by attention. Any ideas how long this FA took? If you guessed half an hour, you are correct. So did exactly what I suggested before in maximizing that sequence. So I ran two indirect assessments. I gave one to a parent, I think it was a teacher and a paraprofessional in the classroom. Figured out that it likely was maintained by attention, ran a quick single function test. Each of those sessions were five minutes long determined that there was none in the control condition, higher levels in the attention condition. And then because this was a research project, we actually went on and ran the full FA 
um, and saw that it, it confirmed the single function test. So if you have 30 minutes, you have enough time to run a functional analysis. Uh, awesome. Thank you, Dr. Kloda from Jody. Use five minute sessions frequently. Thank you. I love feedback from your clinical practice there. Um, all right, so let's move on to the next one setting constraints. So where can we do an FA? Uh, so what are the setting environmental requirements to conduct a functional analysis? I remember when I was first kind of learning about FAs, I was imagining like these gorgeous padded rooms with like two one way, two way mirrors and video cameras and like gorgeous things. <laughs> um, quickly realized that that's not real life. Um, so requirements really, from my perspective, we have two. The first priority is safety. So we have to consider the topography of the target behavior and the topography of any behaviors that might emerge if the target behavior is put on extinction. So, you know, certainly we're not going to assess severe property destruction in a greenhouse with lots of windows, right? So we got to make sure that we're going to be able to safely contain any um, occurrence of the problem behavior. And the second one is experimental control. So making sure that the client cannot access the reinforcer anywhere else. In terms of very dangerous behavior, we'll come back to that in another one of the barriers that we'll talk about shortly. So where have FAs been conducted? Um, I just kind of tossed a, you know, a couple options up there. We have examples of functionalities being conducted in the home conducted in typical classrooms. Um, Dr. Sarah Bloom actually changing the format to a trial-based FA to do in the classroom. Um, Dr. Walker, uh, Wacker's lab has been doing this for a long time, doing FAs conducted via telehealth where you're not even in the same place as the um, client. So their FAs in research have been conducted in a lot of, a lot of different places. Um, I thought that I might um, <laughs> pull back the curtain a little bit and show you places that I have conducted functional analyses and what I have done to safely conduct them there. So as long as you're able to control the safety, control the delivery of that punitive reinforcer, you can conduct a, an FA anywhere. So <laughs> this is the Iwata lab. Uh, so these are some of my lab mates as well as some undergraduate research assistants. <laughs> yeah, we see some people recognizing some faces. So if you read a, a study coming out of Dr. Brian Awada's lab, I know I used to picture again, like these beautiful FA rooms. Uh, this is the, the corner of a classroom with a, a folding partition and this is probably not the safest. People are standing on cubicles and things like that, but that's what it looks like. That That is how we create the environment. So this was someone that we were able, it was safe to do it that way, and that partition um, just kind of uh, made sure that we were also able to have experimental control of the variable. Um, this next one, these were some of my graduate students. <laughs> I walked in and they had figured out an option <laughs> to actually look down from the ceiling into the room. They didn't want to have extra data collectors in the actual room because it was distracting to this client. So they, again, probably not the safest. Don't take my advice on standing on reams of paper, but they figured out how to do it, right? <laughs> um, let's see, this one. Uh, we were doing a functional analysis of elopement, so we figured out how to make a little tunnel from two therapy rooms going across the hall. So again, being being creative um, at, while keeping it safe at the same time. So here's a, an assessment where we, we were looking at more severe problem behavior. So now we're in a room that we've kind of emptied out and we put very heavy furniture near anything that would be dangerous for that client to um, engage with. So it looks very different than the first one that was just kind of in the corner of a room. 
And finally here again, this is a functional analysis session going on. So we just had a, you know, hanging out on the floor. We've <laughs> turned the table on the side to have like, this is the session area. Um, but just again, wanted to kind of show you, it's all about being creative, pulling back that curtain for you, showing you um, some fun, interesting places where we've figured out how to safely and effectively conduct functional analyses. All right, um, so let's move on to um, our next barrier is going to be high risk behavior. This is often the one besides time constraints, acceptability, high risk. I would say those are the three that I hear the most. So we're going to spend some time on that. And I have a, a guiding statement here coming from Dr. Hanley's article. And I think that this really also expresses my stance on conducting functional analyses of, of high risk or dangerous behavior. And he writes, the more dangerous the behavior, the more important it becomes to accurately determine the behavioral function so that a precise and effective treatment can be prescribed as soon as possible. So we have to pause and, and think about that. If we're saying that a behavior is too dangerous to assess in a functional analysis, we have to consider whether not conducting an FA means that behavior is going to continue longer, unchecked, untreated, um, without an effective intervention in place. So it's a it's a balance. Certainly there are behaviors that we absolutely cannot allow to occur even once because they are too dangerous. Uh, but there are a lot of times when a dangerous behavior would be um, a candidate for a functional analysis because ethically the the more um, the client centered you know approach would be to find an effective treatment. I'm gonna pause for a second because Dr. Michelle says the chat is fixed. I don't know if um, are there any special instructions, Dr. Michelle, on what they have to do? <laughs> Yeah, yes, please. If everyone, when you're sending a message, can you send it to everyone and not all attendees? Because previously when uh, the option all attendees, it was just going in amongst yourselves and not to Dr. Sarah. So please ensure you're clicking on everyone and then everyone can see it. So thank you so much for your patience and thank you, Dr. Sarah. Yeah, I mean, if you want to just send messages to each other, you guys, you can keep doing that too and, and converse amongst yourselves. Um, yeah, I'd love to see all the things that you are, are thinking about and talking about. So this is my guiding statement when someone asks me about functional analyses of high risk behavior. And something else to consider that's also mentioned in the Hanley paper is that when the contingencies are arranged properly, in the test and control conditions of a functional analysis, it actually sets the occasion for decreased intens intensity of the target behavior when we compare it to just non-assessment context, like every day. So it's, it's quite common to see a behavior uh, like aggression that is very severe when it's occurring, you know, in the home, at school, but as soon as you put it into an FA, the intensity of it, the rate of it decreases. Um, and it seems a little counterintuitive at first. You're like, you're evoking it, what? But it's because in the test condition, yeah, we, we do have an establishing operation in place. That's how we're, we're looking to see if the problem behavior is going to occur. But we give that potential reinforcer immediately, every time the target behavior occurs. So again, imagine something like aggression. Um, it is, uh, that's kind of one of my areas of interest, expertise, what I study. It's not super common to see a client who has aggression in their repertoire that they go from like, you know, sitting calmly to like, whoa, like major aggression. It, it doesn't happen. It usually escalates. So usually there's going to be some, you know, some poking, some pinching, some scratching before it's, it's hair pulling, it's punching, it, it's things like that. In a functional analysis, we're not waiting for it to get to the punching and the hair pulling. As soon as there's a pinch, as soon as there's a scratch, we deliver the reinforcer. And then there's no reason to engage in the target behavior, right? They, they got the reinforcer for that very minor version. 
And the control condition, our likely reinforcers are freely available continuously. There's no establishing operation in place. So there's really, you know, loosely speaking, no um, reason for the, the problem behavior to occur. So even if you are looking at high risk behavior, it's possible that the intensity of it will be decreased. Now, Dr. Hanley does, you know, give the caution that we want to be very careful to not use extinction procedures, like not use an extinction control kind of outside of today's talk. But if we're putting the problem behavior on extinction, we will see it increase, right? If we're not delivering the reinforcer immediately. Um, awesome. I'm seeing that this happens so many times in Amal's experience. So thank you for um, chiming in with your clinical experience there. So I have some some data. Um, it's not exactly the kind of situation I was just describing, but these are data from another paper by Dr. Eileen Roscoe. And in this initial FA, there was a lot of um, problem behavior, loud vocalizations in this situation kind of happening unchecked, tons of it, really high percentage of sessions. They ended up modifying the functional analysis and really honing in on what the reinforcer was. I, I'm not going to go into the details there, but you can see that the, the behavior, the percentage of session just totally decreased because he was accessing the reinforcer immediately once they went to that modified FA. So you can kind of imagine this like on the left um, initial FA, this might be what problem behavior looks like in the natural environment. As soon as you run the FA, you'll see problem behavior, but it will decrease. So it doesn't always happen, but um, oftentimes you will see that decreased intensity. So I usually ask, um, you know, are the assessment conditions more dangerous than the daily conditions under which the behavior is, is not controlled? If the assessment conditions are not more dangerous, then I will usually go, go forward with the functional analysis. Um, yes, and Rachel is mentioning precursor FAs, and we will get there for sure. So feel free um, to identify precursor. Uh, yes, exactly, Rachel. So we will get there. So feel free to also put in more examples um, or experience when we get to the precursor option. We do need to ask. Uh, you know, is this a behavior that is so dangerous that it cannot be allowed to occur even once under assessment conditions? So, for example, pica of poisonous substances, like eating um, medicines, eating cleaning products, that can, can never occur, obviously, right? But there are still ways to conduct a functional analysis of the behavior by removing the dangerous part. So, instead of having a cleaning product in the bottle, can we replace it with water and food coloring or something like that? So again, it's the creative thinking um, while decreasing risk. So some other options here, yes, eating a washcloth would be an example of a behavior that we absolutely cannot um, allow to occur even once because that would be far too dangerous. So we we'll probably want to consider using some pre-FA assessments. So conducting a risk benefit analysis, that's the question I had before, are the risks of, of conducting an FA higher or lower than the risks of untreated behavior? Um, and including all relevant stakeholders in the determination, you know, caregivers, um, supervisors, people like that. And then, I do this always when assessing aggression, using an indirect assessment to gather data about the topography of problem behavior. So I use that information to write the operational definition, to design safe FA conditions. I ask someone was mentioning precursors or minor topographies. I include even the most minor topographies of the target behavior in the operational definition. So when I'm assessing aggression, often my operational definition is any touching without asking. So even if they're poking gently or touching, um, I will deliver the consequences there. Um, so again, include those more minor topographies. So someone was asking about, um, 
you know, biting, things like that. Um, there's a potential to use protective equipment. Um, it has been shown in the research to potentially extinguish responding, um, but uh, protective equipment can take the form of, of many of these items. If you work with severe behavior and you do not have a copy of the Handbook of Crisis Intervention and Developmental Disabilities, um, this is a phenomenal book that I recommend to everyone who works with this population. Um, this is a, a picture from that, that book. Um, they, every chapter, they'd go through everything from staff training to intervention to assessment. So this also is in your reference list. Um, highly recommend getting your hands on that um, if you need another resource about severe behavior. Now, the stuff on the right is a little intense, right? We don't usually have those laying around our house or the clinic um, unless we're working in a severe behavior unit. Um, but here are maybe some things that you might have laying around on the right there. This is from Behavior Man's uh, Facebook page. I know many of you have probably been creative, look totally natural, but you've got your bite protection on, right? Um, here, a picture down below, if you can tell from all of the blue in the image, but people are wearing full denim get-ups there, so denim jackets, uh, denim pants, so jean jackets, jean pants. Uh, over here on the left, this was me packing my bag one morning. Anyone guess what, uh, what behavior I was assessing with this kit over here with a running shirt, sunglasses, masks before they were common and gloves <laughs> yeah you all got it exactly face directed spitting oh vomiting would be a, a close call but no yeah face directed spitting so think about ways to protect yourself and your client and still being able to let a minor topography of the problem behavior occur Another option here besides using protective equipment, I told you we'd come back to the latency um, based assessment. So we can use latency as a measure of response strength. So usually in a functional analysis, we're looking at uh, rate or percentage occurrence. Uh, what we could look at instead was how long from the start of the session until the first instance of the behavior how long does it take? Do they like immediately engage in the problem behavior or do they just not engage at all? So this is what a latency based functional analysis would look like. Over here on the Y axis is how long from the start of the session to the response. Anywhere from, you know, immediately it took one second up to five minutes, which the, this would have been a five minute FA. So here you can see in this square condition, we'll call it the attention condition. Um, every time they run this condition, the behavior occurs like pretty immediately. In all the other conditions, it's not occurring at all. It's timing out to five minutes. Um, and the neat part here is that you stop the session after one instance. So if this is aggression, um, as soon as they engage in that first uh, aggression, you're done. <laughs> session over, move on, come back to the next session. See, so you, overall, you're having them engage in much less problem behavior. Uh, these are some, some data from clinical practice. Uh, it's a little bit of a confusing graph, but I started a single function test using responses per minute. So it's graphed over here on the left Y axis. Uh, and the behavior started escalating and it was really severe. Um, it was quickly apparent to us that it was too dangerous to have his aggression occur repeatedly. So if I was doing this just clinically, I would have stopped here and said, yes, we identified the function, but this was for research. So we had to confirm the function. So we switched to a latency based FA and got the same results. So over here on the Y axis on the right, is how many seconds it took until Marvin engaged in aggression. In pretty much all the other conditions, it timed out. He went all the way to five minutes and never engaged. In the, the red square data path, um, that is the attention condition, and it was, it was pretty immediate in most of those. Uh, Holly Wiggins, that is an awesome idea. Thank you for um, popping that into the chat. 
And a final option that um, someone said before was looking at precursors. So it is possible to conduct a precursor, a functional analysis of precursors instead. Um, so this is described very well in Smith and Churchill. Again, it's in your reference list. So here the idea is, you know, if someone reliably like bangs on the table before they flip the table, before they get up to come to aggress, we don't need to wait until they've banged the table, flipped the table, and stood up and come towards you. Let's do the FA on the banging the table and deliver the reinforcer, and then there, there's no need to, to reinforce or to get all the way to the more major problem behavior. It does require a very good identification of a precursor behavior. The whole thing can fall apart if you're not accurately identifying that. So Dr. Jen Fritz and her colleagues in 2013 published a, a paper about how you can very empirically identify precursor behaviors. So if you're gonna run a precursor FA, recommend checking out that paper um, before you do that. All right, so we're doing well with timing coming into the, the last quarter with just a few left to go. So next up is low rate behavior. So what do we mean by low rate behavior? Um, this is behavior that may be happening um, with some degree of regularity in the non-assessment context. So every day at home, at school, and then you run the FA and like nothing. <laughs> Know if any of you who run FAs frequently have have had this problem. Uh, it is a, a common occurrence. So we're going to go through some different reasons why low rate behavior might occur. And the first is that there may be some sort of idiosyncratic establishing operation or or reinforcer, meaning a very individualized EO or reinforcer here. This is a time where I would recommend doing a short observation, descriptive assessment in the natural environment to identify potentially what you're seeing that might be a, an antecedent or a consequence out there. Then take that information from the descriptive assessment and customize some test and control conditions to identify the effects of those variables. So, this is from the start of the presentation. You can remember that any variable can be tested as long as your test condition has the variable delivered right after the problem behavior. And in your control condition, the variable is delivered non-contingently. It, it's free there. So let's go back to that graph that I showed before where I had low rate behavior. So Stephen and I, we did an FA on aggression and he was hurting people in his classroom, it was very, it was still ongoing, even when we were running the conditions. Um, so, popped into his classroom, and I saw that a lot of the aggression was around food. So, he was pushing other students out of the way to get food, um, he was aggressing to his teachers until they opened the closet to access the food. So, I constructed two conditions, a test condition called contingent tangible, meaning when he engaged in aggression, he would get access to food, and NCR tangible, meaning non-contingent access to food. So we just gave him a big bowl of food at the start of the session. Um, and we saw that for sure, we definitely saw aggression here, looking that potentially his aggression was maintained by access to food. Uh, this is a cautionary tale for everyone. Anyone want to guess why I have this, this zero <laughs> data point down here on our third session of the contingent tangible? This is lessons on what not to do when you run your functional analysis. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Angie, Dr. Shannon, uh, I was just so excited that I was like, let's get this done. He's engaging in aggression. We got this. Yeah, the guy was full. <laughs> he like ran so many sessions in a row in one day. So we called it quits for that day, came back the next day and saw tons of um, problem behavior afterwards. Uh, Anna Kate, that would have been a, a good guess too, but it was just that he was satiated. All right, so another option, there are some 
kind of common um, idiosyncratic variables. So potentially divided attention. So Dr. Tara Famey and her colleagues in 2013, they looked at a divided attention condition. So there are, um, you know, some individuals for whom, uh, you know, they, they might engage in problem behavior for attention, but if the target adults is giving attention to someone else, they're having a conversation with another adult, they're paying attention to another kid, that's when problem behavior really occurs. So this article um, by Femi et al. walks through how to put together a divided attention uh, condition. So we can see here in Elijah's data, he engaged in more problem behavior when that was the EO. Another example would be kind of combined contingencies. So potentially, um, you know, not just escape from work, but escape to a tangible. Item. So, Dr. Jennifer Zarconi in 1990, oops, 1996, um, they looked at, you know, how much responding was going to occur when the client was accessing a break, like, just like, there's no work, just chill, um, or a break with preferred stimuli. So, today, you know, it would be probably a break with an iPad or something like that. So, there's a possibility that you have these kind of combined contingencies where one or the other doesn't really catch all of it. Um, if you are curious, Dr. Kevin Schlickenmeyer and colleagues in 2013, they put together an awesome review of lots of idiosyncratic variables. So this is a table from their paper and you can see everything from, you know, the tone of the instructional style, the wording of the instructions, and then all of the articles that have demonstrated that in research. So this is a, if you're kind of thinking about what could some variables be, um, this is a good place to start. And then also Dr. Eileen Roscoe in 2015 um, published a systematic approach to identifying those idiosyncratic variables. And again, I know we have some people in the audience who are experts with this um, approach. So if you're looking for a way to figure out if you, you have low rate behavior, you don't even know where to start, this is a good article to turn to, to figure out how do I kind of proceed through this using some indirect assessments to identify, um, you know, the, really what we could test in the functional analysis. So those are some resources for idiosyncratic variables. It's also possible that low rate behavior occurs um, because of insufficient exposure to the test condition. So maybe five minutes isn't enough time for the establishing operation to, to build up. You know, maybe it's not a big deal that I don't have attention for five minutes, so I have to work for five minutes. Uh, so here you may want to consider lengthening them. You know, use 10 minute sessions, use 15 minute sessions. There's actually a, an article, Dr. Sung Wu Kong and colleagues in 2001, uh, they did an eight hour <laughs> session of FAs. So each day they'd come in um, and they'd be running a condition for a day. So you really could could stretch these out if you need to really build the establishing operation. Another option here is to consider using a fixed sequence of conditions to maximize those EOs. So if you have looked at closely at all of the FA data that I have shown you, you will see that I usually run alone, attention, play, demand. I, usually I do no interaction, but alone, attention, play, demand, alone, attention, play, demand. I do that because of a paper that Dr. Jen Hammond and her colleagues published in 2013. If we do this sequence, it actually builds the EOs for the attention condition and the demand condition very well. Because the person will have had no attention all this time and into the attention condition. And here on the, the play to demand, here they're doing tons of fun stuff, no work, and then a very abrupt shift into work and tasks or whatever the, the demands of are. So a recommendation there, if you're seeing low rate behavior, consider extending the sessions and consider using a fixed sequence of conditions. 
Another reason might be that um, if you have combined response topographies, so if you're just saying, I'm doing an FA of problem behavior, and whether they engage in property destruction or aggression or self injurious behavior, you know, I'll, I'll give the consequences. Um, that can kind of muddy things. So you may want to consider um, that there might be a response class hierarchy and separating out those topographies instead of lumping them together. So here's an example um, from the Richmond et al. paper where they did a functional analysis and they had combined disruption and aggression. So it looks like um, aggression, a, a disruption, you know, that maybe was kind of like a precursor, I guess you could say, potentially to aggression. So as soon as they engaged in disruption, they got the reinforcer. Unfortunately, they never saw aggression. So they couldn't confirm whether or not um, escape from demands also was the function for aggression. So the recommendation here would be do a functional analysis of disruption, get clean data, do a functional analysis of aggression and get your data there. And finally, and a final option of, of why you might have low rate behavior might be because the target behavior usually occurs covertly, um, meaning they do it kind of in secret, no one's watching. So you may want to consider using some sort of less obtru um, obtrusive observation method, uh, imagining my grad students with their heads in the ceiling, right? Um, or using a response product measure. So is there a way to, um, you know, not have someone in the room with them, but be able to, this study here was looking at, um, eating food that, that someone was not supposed to be eating. So they had containers and they weighed them before the session. And then the, the client just, you know, was in the room by themselves. There was no observation going on. There was no one there. So they thought they were alone. They were alone. And then afterwards they would weigh the two containers to see if food was consumed. So an option there, if you think that you might not be seeing behavior because of the observation. All right, let's move into our final options here for undifferentiated results. So it's they're really similar to the low rate behavior suggestions because low rate behavior really is a, a specific type of undifferentiated responding. So a lot of the suggestions I just went through for overcoming low rate behavior can be applied to undifferentiated results in general. One specific option here might be to consider adding discriminative stimuli to each condition. So Juliet Connors and colleagues in 2000 um, showed that if you wear, you know, different color shirts in each condition, in the attention condition, you wear a red shirt, in the escape condition, you wear a blue shirt, um, that it will help the clients kind of determine more quickly what the contingent, what contingencies are in place. Typically, with undifferentiated results, you're probably going to need some sort of modification to the FA procedures. So, Dr. Lewis Hagopian and colleagues um, did put together a massive study um, where they looked at FAs that had been conducted, I think 176 of them, um, and looked at what changes, if there was an initial undifferentiated FA, what procedures would get to a result. So the most effective in their study, um, and this was a retrospective look at some FA data, most effective was a design change. You know, instead of using a, a multi-element design, user reversal design instead. Second most effective was separating those aggregate responses. So if you're doing an FA of, of Property destruction and aggression together separate those out do two separate FAs. And the least effective that they found were um, changes to antecedent stimuli, like where it's being conducted. So similar to the Schlickenmeyer study um, with the idiosyncratic variables, this is a really nice place to go if you want to look at some design changes. And again, they, they kind of talk you through what each of these modifications look like. So this is something that I do 
quite commonly. So here's an FA of aggression for Jamal. I ran a standard multi-element design. It's a little bit, but not really enough to convince me. So I switched to a single function test. I just went back and forth between attention and control and saw pretty quickly confirmed that attention was the maintaining variable there. If you still have undifferentiated results, you may want to consider multiple control. Um, so potentially the target behavior might be maintained by more than one source of reinforcement. So access to attention and access to escape. I really do recommend that first you ensure that any multiple response topographies are not aggregated. Um, Dr. Gracie Beavers and Awada in 2011 looked at the prevalence of multiple control and it is much, much higher when people are aggregating or, or combining those response topographies. So separate those out to see if it fixes your problem. If not, you may have a, a true situation of multiple control as we did here with Elliot. Um, we can see that there was a lot of aggression in both the attention condition and the demand condition. Turned out he was someone for whom um, aggression was maintained by access to both of those reinforcers. So differentiated results, very similar to low rate um, options. All right, so we were talking about acceptability. My number one recommendation here, if you are having trouble with acceptability, is to lead with a relationship, not with data. And this is so hard for me as a behavior analyst, as a science, like, I just want to show everyone the data and how exciting it is and, and convince them that way. There was a really interesting article published in 2016 in an ABAI journal, David Friedman, is not a behavior analyst, he is a journalist. Um, and he came in with some recommendations on how to improve the public perception of behavior analysis. We have some dissemination issues, right? So he recommended some strategies like reframing the field's techniques and principles in a friendlier, more resonant form, playing up the warm and fuzzy side of behavior analysts. And the, the quote that it was so hard for me to accept <laughs> swallow is that we're not going to get anywhere by kind of forcing our way through with data. So behavior analysis cannot benefit in this competition by pointing to what we think is our greatest strength, which is a sound, a solid grounding in scientific evidence. We have to put that aside and kind of appeal to the, the more warm and fuzzy side, as he put it. So my recommendations, you know, foster a relationship before introducing a functional analysis and really listen when the clients and caregivers are telling you about their target behavior. Their insights are very valuable and actually probably can be incorporated into an eventual functional analysis. Utilize those soft skills to, to build trust and, and truly be trustworthy, right? And again, there are, are whole webinars, people who specialize in this. So this is not a, a path we're going down tonight to talk about what those soft skills are and how to utilize them. But it's a skill set that we need to develop and, and reinforce as behavior analysts. And you can also, if you're feeling awkward about how to foster a relationship, um, consider using an open-ended interview like the one in Hanley et al., or Hanley 2012. Use that as a, a starting point. It kind of guides your conversation, but it's not like super structured and, and um, allows you to have conversation along the way. Also make sure to explain the functional analysis in appropriate terms. So explain the why as well as the what. Um, so why is a functional analysis crucial to the assessment treatment progression? That's how I started tonight, right? Talking about the why. What happens if we don't have the function identified correctly? And use terminology that matches the comprehension and preference of the listener. So some people may want you to go into the science. Others may want you to just kind of explain it on the surface. Consider using an analogy. Many of us will use the, the common analogy of an allergy test. So like I used at the beginning, you know, we're 
just like an allergy test is exposing you to small controlled amounts of the potential allergen, a functional analysis, you know, exposes you to small potential amounts of a potential reinforcer. Definitely also recommend uh, getting informed consent involvement. So consider at your clinical site having a, a functional analysis consent template that you can customize as needed. Conduct a risk benefit analysis, include those results in the consent form. So if you've determined that the risk of not conducting a functional analysis is greater than the risk of conducting a functional analysis, include that in your consent form so that people truly can be informed when they're making a decision about yes or no. And consider involving the parent or caregiver guardian in the FA process. You know, can they collect data? Can they be a therapist? Would that actually help your results potentially? You know, at a minimum in regular data reviews, show them what they're doing. So it's not a, a secret um, of what you're doing in your assessment room. So whew, we got through seven barriers. Um, all we have left is just a, a quick wrap up, some final comments. I hope you're going to leave here tonight um, feeling a little bit more confident that if you encounter some of these variables, you'll remember something about how to address them and then go back to your reference list to have those resources forever. So I'm going to wrap up by talking about kind of summarizing what FAs are and what FAs are not. Um, I'm going to start with the second half of that, what they are not. So FAs are not a rigid procedure with three to four test conditions and a control condition. FAs are so much more flexible than that. FAs are not something that only researchers or BCBADs can do. This is something that should be accessible so anyone who is interested in figuring out the source of reinforcement for problem behavior can conduct a functional analysis. And FAs, are not an option to be utilized only if the conditions are ideal. If I only conducted FAs when I had a perfect room and a safe behavior and uh, uh, surrounded by all BCBADs, I would, I would have conducted zero <laughs> FAs because those conditions are never perfect. So it's all about figuring out how to overcome the barriers that you have in that situation. So what FAs are? <laughs> They are an empirical demonstration of a cause-effect relation, going back to our roots, right, with Barry Wolf and Risley. They are an active process that requires the behavior analyst to follow the data, adjust accordingly. Again, this is not a rigid procedure. It's something that's fluid and flexible. You can adjust along the way. And most important, they're a way to ensure effective and ethical behavior reduction interventions. So where to start? If you've never conducted an FA, what do you do after tonight? These are some recommendations from the Awada and Dozier paper. Find a supervisor with experience conducting FAs. That's, that's number one. Participate in evidence-based training on functional analyses. So tonight's a starting point. See if you can get some behavioral skills training with someone. This is a big one. Conduct your first few functional analyses with cases in which the function seems very clear. Like, do not choose a complicated case for your first FA. Choose something that seems a little obvious. Like, oh, I think this definitely, it's got to be maintained by access to attention. Cool. Do that FA and, and confirm it with the data. Once you've got a few of those done and, and you are feeling comfortable, then you can go on to some more complex ones where you're like, I have no idea what's maintaining this problem behavior. Where do we even start? I recommend opening you know, your method, your data collection, data analysis to peer review, expert supervision, of course, within the boundaries of, of confidentiality that we have, but hopefully you have an opportunity for peer review built into your clinical setting or supervision built in. So make sure that you're showing people what method are you using? Do they have any advice on how you could modify something? Show them your data collection procedures. Look at your data um, with other people to determine, have we identified the function? Do we need to go further? So when you encounter barriers, so now you've started conducting your FAs, what do you do next? Um, if you encounter a barrier, whatever you do, if I um, you know, emphasize nothing else tonight, 
do not take a guess on the function and proceed to writing an intervention plan. If you've encountered that barrier, return to the literature. So you have an extensive reference list after today. Um, you know who to go to, you know who the experts are, who to read to figure out, you know, what do I do if I need to conduct an FA via telehealth? Okay, I'm gonna go to, you know, Dr. Walker, uh, Wacker's lab and, and read what they did. And just keep trying, you know, change one variable at a time and know that most FAs require modification from that original standard from 1982. I would, I don't know, other people who conduct FAs often can chime in the chat, but I would say I have more FAs that require a modification to identify the function than I have FAs that are like perfect, just running it in the standard sort of way. So it is not that you are doing something incorrect. Um, it is that it is challenging you as a scientist and a behavior analyst to figure out those variables. Dr. Angie agrees there in the chat. I recommend seeking peer consultation, supervision, um, seeking expert consultation, supervision, someone who's done a lot of functional analyses. And there's also always the option to discharge the client into the care of a clinician with more experience and training in conducting FAs to do the assessment piece and then potentially have that client come back to you after the assessment is complete. So if they're able to do the assessment or they can, you know, you can kind of split that requirement or, or they can take the lead, then once the function is identified, they could come back to you to, to run the intervention there. So this wraps us up for tonight. I hope that you will go forth and analyze. Um, you'll keep the analysis and applied behavior analysis. Um, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. So if anyone does have more questions after tonight, you are more than welcome to email me. My email address is up there. Thank you so much. Shukran Jazilan. I am, was a pleasure to um, have everyone here this evening.